got a listing of them, and um, we're hoping people can make a lot of them. It's an amazing uh, group of people that we've assembled. You know, all of those speakers uh, come to my class at 3.30 on campus on Tuesdays, and then they'll be over here at 5.30. Um, and I thought that some people might at least want to do some reading. If you do, they, they, we've got some suggested books here and books they've written. People want to do something ahead of time, you're uh, welcome to do that. We're going to follow the usual format. The lecture is going to be strictly to one hour, and then people feel free to leave at 6.30, and then there'll be questions until 7. I think there's some of our speakers have to get on airplanes. We might have to restrict them and get them out of here about quarter to 7. Um, <clears throat> while I'm thinking of it, um, we anticipate uh, big problems in clearing the parking lot afterward. And the, the first suggestion that we have is that people go out the driveway and turn right, no matter where you're going. The problem is, if you go left, you can get two cars out every two minutes. So we've uh, calculated some of you will still be here at midnight if, uh, if we follow that. You can get two cars at every two minutes. So the only way to do it, I think, is for most people to turn right and then you can go another right and go down Inverness Street and head that way if you want to. And we're double parking. Uh, I don't think I had a problem tonight because of the weather and I presume we'll have larger crowds as we go along. And one of the things that we're going to ask is if people are willing to double park, like if you do it masses a lot of churches. Um, and that if everyone, the people who are not going to stay till 7 can't get themselves blocked in. I think that's the essence of it. But if people are willing to stay till 7, then we can double park along a number of lines there. And I think uh, work it out. Enough uh, by way of uh, logistics and so on. Um, the whole series is on Catholic thought and a particular topics, as, as you can see. So uh, a great array of topics from world religions to the papacy to human sexuality and health care and the arts. So it's, but it's always Catholic thought. And my topic is Revelation. And as always, I like to try to stay in touch with experience, so I'm going to use uh, two different uh, composite figures to, to touch in to what this is all about. The first I am calling Gus, um, one of my favorite names for people. Um, it'll become evident as we go along, probably. So Gus is uh, roughly middle-aged, successful man, um, has a family and a good wife and things going well and he's got a decent job and he's worked hard to get to where he is and now he doesn't know if he wants to be there where he is. So he's uh, wondering, you know, what's this all about? Does this uh, make any sense? Uh, why have I worked this hard? Do I want to keep putting in this many hours the rest of my life? Am I really accomplishing anything? Do I, is there any purpose in all my expenditure of energy? Do my kids really appreciate what I've tried to do for them? Uh, my wife's had to put up with a lot uh, of sacrifices because I'm tied up so much. And does that make any sense? Am I blowing a good part of my life this way? Uh, generally, since, uh, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, am I going to change jobs? Or am I going to uh, leave my family? Or am I going to start a new career? What, what, is, what is that all about? So, uh, Gus, I see, involved in uh, a secularized version of the question of revelation. That is, fundamentally, does life make any sense? Does it have a purpose? Is it a tale told by an idiot? Or does it indeed have some purpose and meaning to it? Uh, in another version, it might be, is this universe of ours hospitable or not? Uh, we really have a home here. So that, I see, is a secularized version of the question of Revelation. Then we have another uh, person, um, a woman, a collegian, name of Monica, who also is uh, dealing uh, with question in an implicit way. She's Catholic and up in the Catholic family and um, regularly and mm, like faith and so on. 
And uh, she uh, has a sort of friends, uh, people who are largely into uh, uh, fundamental. They, uh, they understand the Bible very literally. They, well, everybody in the group has had a shock conversion experience. Uh, all of them uh, talk about the gifts of the, that they've received. They all read the Bible regularly. And uh, they are trying to get Monica to come and be part of their group. Or they want to get all the time, well, why do you go to the Catholic Church and, and they don't even the Bible there? And uh, they, uh, we know you're Catholic, are you really Christian or not? And Sonica is under a lot of pressure from her friends to leave the Catholic community and join uh, this uh, fundamentalist group of Christians. So I suggest that Monica as well is involved in this Christian revelation. It's a explicitly religious question for her. Is there a word for it? Is there a divine message or not? And where can you find that message? Is there any clear guidance for her life? One of the things that bugs Monica is that she has a lot of questions, a lot of doubts. She's trying to figure out her career, doesn't always know what she's supposed to do or what's the right thing to do. And all these other people, this peer group of friends, they all got it clear. Jesus tells them what to do, and they know exactly how to live their life. And that becomes rather seductive for Monica. Uh, she keeps thinking, May I might be missing something here in my life, something not right with me, and I need, uh, maybe I got to look into what do these other young women have in my group of friends that I don't have. Again, I see it as a, uh, as an explicitly religious version of this question of revelation. Now, I think that um, when we begin to examine the question of revelation, it's not just um, you know contemporary people like that. They are the product of criticisms in the 19th and 20th century. So we have had a whole series of important uh, scholarly criticisms of the whole idea of religion, of revelation, of an afterlife, and so on. And one of the ways that comes out and was uh, epitomized is in the famous madman parable of Friedrich Nietzsche. He wrote it in the Gay Science uh, late in the 19th century. I'm remembering around 1880 or so. And a lot of you know the parable of the madman, but I'll give you my own version of it slightly paraphrased from Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher of an uh, important person in the criticism of the 19th century. So this is a parable of a madman comes to the marketplace and he cries out incessantly, where is God? I seek God. And the people in the marketplace, who are, by the way, atheists and don't believe in God, make fun of the madman. And they say, well, what's the problem? Did you lose him? Or is he on a leave of absence? Or did he take off, unbeknownst? And the madman says, no. No. God is dead. Madman says, no, God is dead. And now that God is dead, the earth is unchanged from the sun. Now that God is dead, we don't know up from down, and it's like floating around in dark space, in nothingness, no moorings, nothing to hang on to. And the madman goes on, and I'll tell you how God died. We killed him. We killed him with our own hands. And now who will wipe the blood from our hands. Who will take away the guilt from this terrible crime of killing God? And on that same day, the madman went into the churches. And when he encountered believers in the churches, he told them again about the death of God. And he said, these churches are nothing but the tombs of that dead deity. Well, Friedrich Nietzsche was a prophetic figure in the 19th century. He represented um, much of this criticism of religion and revelation. All the historic critics, I mean, a lot of them were more familiar with. Karl Marx, for example, who said, well, religion is nothing but an opiate of the people. It's like a drug. 
put your mind on heaven and takes your mind off of making this world a better place. We're familiar with Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud said that all this belief in God and revelation is an illusion. It's a projection. We need it, and therefore we make it up. We need a crutch. We need something to hang on to. Therefore, we invent this God. We project this image of God. And so Freud stands as uh, one of the critics who says that, well, this belief in Revelation will keep you in an infantile state. You'll be childish all your life. You'll never grow up, never be mature, never be enlightened as long as you hang on to this childish faith in a God who speaks a word to us. And then just to pick one more, Albert Camus. Albert Camus uh, writes the myth of Sisyphus, uh, borrowing from Greek mythology, puts it in a contemporary context. Sisyphus is the one condemned by the gods to take the big rock, roll it up to the top of the mountain, push it all the way up, only to have it fall down, and then he must go down and get the rock and push it up once again. And he must do that not just for a day or a week, a month, a year, but forever. And Camus, in a telling phrase in that essay on the myth of Sisyphus, says at one point, Sisyphus has a smile on his face. For Camus, Sisyphus represents the absurd hero, the person willing to live without revelation, person willing to live in a world that seems to have no meaning or sense. So here we're getting the great critics. You see Gus and Monica in some way or another are influenced by whether they ever read these people or not or ever heard of them or know anything about them. Somehow or another their message is in the culture in which we live. These great critics of religion of 19th and 20th century. Like John Paul Sartre said, man is a useless passion. A useless passion because we want a word from the Lord. We want to even be the Lord. We want to be God, and we cannot do it. Any theology of revelation that's worth anything at all has to be able to respond not only to Nietzsche and to Marx and Freud, but also to Gus and to Monica. It has to say something to them about real life and how to make sense out of their existence. Now, theology of uh, Revelation uh, in Catholic style has to go back to the Scriptures. No, that's very important for us to remember. One of the things that uh, the friends say to Monica is, well, you people don't really believe in the Bible. The Catholics really aren't into the scriptures. They don't really uh, take them seriously like we do. And that's a criticism that we have to take seriously. Historically, there's a grain of truth in it. Where we Catholics did not put enough emphasis on the scriptures. So any full answer that uh, Monica needs to mount is going to have to come back to what the Vatican, Second Vatican Council said and our renewed emphasis on the importance of the scriptures. And if we're going to do a theology of revelation, it's got to be rooted right there in the Bible itself. All Catholic theology has to grow out of that as a reflection on the scriptures, that the scriptures remain normative for us. I still remember Hans Kung when he lectured here years ago, and afterwards he was over at my house, and there were a group of students, um, fundamentalists, who had rented his lecture, and they uh, drove away from the lecture and they came back and told me that the Spirit had convicted them to challenge this uh, Hans Kung because, and, I, and so I went in the house and I told Hans, I said, uh, well, these group of students out here uh, want to challenge you. I said, you know, I can uh, uh, get rid of them if you want and talk to them. He said, no, no, I want to talk to them. One of the dogs that goes out and they says, we have been convicted by the Spirit to tell you that uh, you are not serious enough about the Scriptures. And he said, the Scriptures, the Scriptures are the norm of every norm. The Scriptures are the lifeblood of the Christian community. The Scriptures are absolutely essential. That's where we draw the truth and the wisdom of the Gospel. It's got to have the Scriptures. They asked him another question. He responded in the same way. <laughs> And then I guess the Spirit moved them to leave. Uh.
quietly to that point. Well, it was his uh, sort of overreaction, uh, you know, point of saying, no, we've got in the Catholic community, we've got to keep that in mind, importance of the Scriptures. So when we talk about theology and revelation, i go right back there to the Bible. And I want to do it, could, could start, talk all about what it says in the Hebrew Scriptures and so on, all through the Gospels and everything. But I want to choose the two greatest theologians we find in uh, the, the New Testament to get a fix on this and different outlooks on, script, uh, on Revelation. First, the Apostle Paul. So we all got some sense of Paul. We know a lot about him. He was a Jew, um, Roman citizen, a Pharisee, serious about the law, um, contemporary of Jesus, probably right about the same age and so on, and uh, didn't know Jesus. And uh, he's uh, so serious about his religion that he sees these Christians, the followers of Jesus, being heretics, Jewish heretics. And so he said, we got to shape that up. We can't allow this heresy. And so he begins to persecute the Christians. And we read that he's there when the first martyr, Stephen, is stoned to death. Paul's there holding the coats, uh, condoning this whole uh, violent action against the Christians. So we got Paul. He's decisive. He's strong. He's impetuous. And he's going to save the faith. And then one day on the road to Damascus, something happened. You get different uh, portrayals of that experience in the Scriptures. One way is thinking, uh, is the risen Christ appeared to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Persecuting me? Persecuting the Lord? And it was like scales dropped from Paul's eyes. It's like he saw it suddenly, blindingly, clearly. He had been totally wrong, totally off base. Jesus had been raised to life, and the, his followers were on the right path, not the wrong. They weren't heretics. They were following the truth. They knew the right direction, and there's Paul just changed like that. Suddenly converted, turned around, doing a 180. And now he becomes as passionate about spreading the gospel as before. He becomes the great apostle of the Gentiles. And he goes out and he says, I'm going to preach Christ and him crucified. I don't care if it's foolishness, seen as foolishness or folly. He's going to preach Christ crucified no matter what. And Paul is adamant in this. It's not like Paul a month later says, I better rethink this. I mean, well, maybe I didn't get this right. <laughs> you can't imagine. Paul, and then he got it right. It is a striking conversion. So powerful. So clear to him. And he's carried. That was a revelatory moment for Paul. And then there's the other great theologian in the New Testament, John. Uh, in John, now, we don't, we got a very different kind of picture here. Um, John's not one who was out persecuting the Christians. I mean, he's in on the ground floor. Uh, he, he's writing about the experience of the beloved disciple, the one that's close to Jesus from the beginning, the one who founded a community, the one who was on track from the word go from the time he was called, the beloved disciple. We don't know his name, but the beloved disciple um, understood the message of Jesus. You know, that great story in John's Gospel about Peter and John. And they're, they're both here that something's going on at the tomb. And so John, being the swifter, runs ahead of Peter, gets to the tomb, but he lets Peter go in first. And Peter goes in, but Peter doesn't get it. But the beloved disciple, having shown proper respect to Peter, head of the community, one who represents the authority, then goes in, guided by the Spirit. He understands it. He gets it. Now, a lot of that experience of the beloved disciple, this community of John, arises. And sooner or later, they're going to write this all down. And now we got a different tone. Not once for all sharp experience. Now it's... Couldn't get it all at once. 
Jesus in that God says, better that I go. You can't understand everything I got to say. You got to think about this. You got to reflect on it. It's going to take time. I'm going to send the paraclete. I'll send the spirit to you. And the paraclete will instruct you in all that I've been trying to tell you. It's the paraclete that will stay present in the community and help the community understand what Jesus is all about. Now we get an ongoing process. Now we got a developmental scene. Now we got the spirit at work in the community. Not once for all, not sharp and decisive, but now pondering. What does this mean? What does this mean that he fed all those people? What's the meaning of the death and resurrection of the Lord? And what does it mean for our lives? Well, two great theologians right there in the scriptural time talking about Revelation in a very different kind of way. One of the things it tells us right away is there's pluralism. I want Monica to hear that. I want Monica to hear that. She has to hear it to bolster her confidence. Her friends are more like Paul. They all point to some sharp conversion experience. Boom, it turned around. No turning back, that's it. But Monica has to know there's a gospel of John, that there's a beloved disciple, that there's a process, that it's gradual, that there's various ways of hearing the word of the Lord. Various ways, not one way, not always speaking in tongues, not just sharp conversion experience, for some much more gradual process. Some just drinking in the Spirit, letting the living water flow in one's heart, trying to see what the living master is all about. Monica has to see that as validation of her own life so that she gets confidence that her method, her way of following the Lord, has validity in the Scriptures and is a legitimate way of trying to come closer to Christ. Now let me uh, turn uh, to the theological tradition. What happens is throughout history is that people think about that. They think about the stories. They think about what they mean for everyday life. And in our long Catholic heritage through two millennia, we have um, great figures. Oh, we could begin with Origen, the start of... Uh, uh, the great, first great systematic theologian, uh, the one who incorporated Greek thought into Christian understanding, one of the most influential theologians who ever lived. We could do Origen. But I'm going to concentrate on two others, the most familiar, and I think in many ways for us in the West at least, the most important, and that's Augustine and Aquinas. And again, I, I want to do a little contrast here, and not for historical purposes, but to see what they have to say to Gus and to Monica, and how they might help us to respond to Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and the great critics. So, we've got uh, Augustine in mind. Uh, we're back uh, beginning in the 5th century. Augustine died in 430. Augustine um, had a Christian mother, Monica, and a pagan father. And he was not baptized when he was young. And uh, his parents wanted him to be educated. He was obviously very bright, sent him off to various schools. Didn't really get along too well with his mother, Monica. Monica wanted him to live on a straight and narrow, and he tended to stray. Got mixed up with the Manichaeans. Um, found a mistress who, we must say, was faithful to her, to his mistress, for 15 years till his mother broke up the relationship. Uh, so we got Augustine searching, Manichaeanism, other uh, religious traditions, uh, uh, not satisfied with the restless heart, as he says in Confessions, searching out, what's it all about? Where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do with my life? How do I get along with my mother? What do I do with that heritage of hers? Encounters St. Ambrose in Milan. He ended up teaching in Milan. Encounters St. Ambrose and Christian teaching and begins to make sense to him. And he has this again, Pauline striking conversion experience. 
He had a, uh, he had a son by this mistress. Um, and uh, so, you know, he got responsibilities and all of that. And uh, he, he was reading the, the scriptures, reading Paul. Not in debauchery. Not in uh, wickedness. Not in a strange way, a destructive way of living. But in the power of the Spirit. And here again, we got these striking. Suddenly, it's like a peaceful light took him over. And now he begins to see things in a different way. Beginning of another striking conversion for Augustine. And so eventually he becomes baptized and becomes by acclamation uh, ordained a priest and becomes a bishop, becomes uh, the father of all of, of all of Western theology, the most influential theologian in, in the history of the church. And takes on all of these foes with the same sort of zeal like Paul, like no zeal like the converts. Oh, he turned it around, he saw it clearly, and so anybody's deviating from the proper message, he's going to take them on. Donatus, Pelagian, uh, you name it, whoever it was, he's going to try to strike out at them. Dustin, very attuned to the interior He's the father of Western thought in many of his confessions is the first autobiography in the Western world. An infection, a looking within. He had tremendous capacity to understand his heart, his psyche. You know, the famous passage where he analyzes why he stole hairs as a young man. Why would he steal hairs when he wasn't even holy? It was a great depth. He understood the heart like few people ever had. So, out of all of that, he developed his own theory of revelation, and it's very much inner light. God is truth, but God is within us. He says God's closest than we are to ourselves. You want to look from the Lord? You look in. Search your heart. Get quiet. Reflect. Meditate. Because the Spirit's within you. The Spirit's closer to you are than you are to yourself. It's like an inner light. Truth is inside of you if you just stay open to it. It will illumine the darkness. It will help you to see the error of your way. It will guide you along the right path. We get an interesting combination of Paul and John in uh, Augustine. The once for all experience and yet the continual pondering of what did that all mean and how would I explain it and put it into practice. And then we've got uh, Aquinas. Now we jump up to the 13th century. Aquinas uh, grew up in a well-to-do family and was baptized as a child. In fact, I think it was about the age of six they sent him off to the monastery, to Monte Cassino. His parents had a plan for him, a career path to become an abbot. And that was big time. I mean, you controlled a lot of wealth and power when you were an abbot. Abbot of Monte Cassino is one of the most po powerful people around. His fa family had a plan for him. He's going to make it to the top. And the way they did it is get him into the monastery right away. But Aquinas wasn't comfortable with that, that and with that path. And he went off to study. He was brilliant intellect. And um, became um, more interested in the Dominicans. People really at that time were going to try to live a simple life. Poverty and preach the word, not power as the abbot. And so Aquinas goes in that direction. And he studies and learns. He studies Aristotle, studies Augustine, learns uh, from, uh, the, from the, the uh, Islamic scholars. So a whole bunch of material comes flooding into his head, and he has this great power to put it together. The greatest synthesizer in the history of Christianity. We need to take the faith and fit all these other ideas and put it into a coherent whole. So he was the great teacher, taught at the University of Paris, and um, wrote these great summas, summaries of the faith. So out of all of that kind of experience as a professor and great summarizer, he comes up with a very different idea of revelation. His primary model now is not an interior illumination, but almost expectedly the master-student relationship. So he sees God as the master teacher. God has given us an intellect. God works through this world of ours. God has given us the power to be able to probe this world, to think it through, and to find the deity in that way. 
It has a strong intellectual cast to it. It is a conviction that if we look deeply enough and carefully enough, we'll discover the creator of the whole universe. God works through secondary causes. Works, we, God reveals self to us through people, through the world, through nature, and all of that. We can learn all of that sort of on our own by the power of intellect. Uh, uh, acquires a great confidence in our rational intellectual powers. But since we were weak and fallible and limited, God reveals to us and guides us in this great search. So now we get a very different sense of uh, what Revelation is all about. Not just looking within, but looking with outward. Looking outward at the world. That external world out there is revelatory to us. All of nature is grace. Grace and nature interpenetrate one another. Grace fulfills nature. It's all one whole. That was Aquinas' great genius. Synthesize it, integrate it, get it together so it coheres and it makes sense. Revelation, the great model is God's the teacher and we are the learners and God helps us to learn and encourages us along the way. Well, there we have, um, you know, the great uh, two giants of the theological tradition. Someone once said that all of theology is nothing but a postscript to Augustine. And in the history of our Catholic Church, Aquinas has been raised up as the model for theological work. You know, in the 20th century, when my mentor, for example, Karl Rahner and his compatriot Bernard Lonergan did their doctoral dissertations, they had to do them on Aquinas. It wasn't like, well, I'll write on Sigmund Freud or something. Everybody had to write on Aquinas. It's hard to believe in uh, this day and age. But that's right. That's how crucial it was. You had to write your dissertation on Aquinas, some aspect of it. Um, and when Rahner deviated too much from Aquinas in his, in his study, his dissertation was rejected. That's to show you how Aquinas influenced the thought in, in, even as we moved into the 20th century giants. But the more important question is, what do they say to Gustin and Demonica? I think Augustine's got really important advice for uh, Gus. It is Gus has got to look inward more. And too externally oriented, too outward, too busy, too career oriented, too success oriented. Augustine says, hey, the heart's restless, so it rests in the Lord. You've got to look within. That's where you find illumination. That's where you find what life is all about. Stop. Quiet. Settle down. Get rid of some of the, all the external activities and pay attention to the spirit inside of you. It becomes so important. You're on a journey. Don't be upset about this. Your life isn't going well. This is a journey. This is an opportunity to come closer to the Lord, to understand what it's really all about. This is a spiritual longing that you have to listen to. Pay attention to your heart and not just your head. Augustine's the theologian of the heart, of the affections, of the emotions, of passion. That's what he's got to help Gus to, to see more clearly. And for Monica... I want to bring Aquinas to her attention. I want uh, Monica to realize that not everybody gets a direct word from the Lord into their heads like her friends talk about. In fact, a little more careful reading of Aquinas might wonder about the language used by the fundamentalist and might bring out the notion that all truth is somehow historically and culturally conditioned. All perceptions of what life is all about is filtered through our particular categories, our history, our personality, our outlook on life. None of it is pure. Your friends might talk like it's pure and uninterpreted and straightforward, a message from Jesus, do this. But someday they may see that a more careful appraisal of that experience sees more ambiguity than at first they are ready to admit. So I want to help Monica to sort that through. 
in response to her friends. But I also want to validate again her own sense of how she's going to come to know the will of the Lord for herself. She's probably not going to see it written on a blackboard in the sky someday what her career path should be. She's going to learn her career path by discernment, by thinking it through, by seeing what she's interested in, by trying to gauge what she's good at, by trying to see where life leads her. So God works through secondary causes, works through the finite world. I'm going to tell Monica, you don't have to expect some divine revelation to knock you off your horse. Just pay attention. Just be true to yourself. Try to find out what is you are able to do. What are your talents? What are your interests? What can you accomplish in the world? How can you serve the common good in the best way? You don't have to be afraid, I tell Monica, of where that might take you. That's a safe path, finally, because it's a path guided by the Spirit. Well, what happens in the church is that sooner or later we feel the need to codify it, to get it together. We've got Paul and John and all the rest of the theologies in the New Testament, and we've got these great theologians, Origen and and Augustine and Aquinas and Bonaventure and Cardinal Newman in the 19th century got all of these uh, theological things going on, but sometimes the church has felt a need to stop and say, whoa, we might be off the track here. We've got to check it out. need some test cases. We call those ecumenical councils. We had 21 of them. The councils are called generally in order to combat a heresy, to look at what is going on and say maybe we need to change it in some way. We need a test of orthodoxy. We need a statement. We need a creed. So the Council of Council Calcin tells us, uh, well, in Jesus Christ there is one person but two natures, divine and human. And so he set that out there. One person, two natures, divine and human, to see who's orthodox and who isn't. So throughout history that happened. Now, throughout all of the first councils, through the first 19 councils, the question of revelation was not a live question because Nietzsche hadn't lived yet. The Feuerbach hadn't made his criticism yet, so they didn't need to ask the question, well, is there a revelation? Or They didn't have to ask that question because there wasn't anybody denying it. Everybody believed in revelation. Everybody believed that God had spoken through Christ. They didn't have to fight that. But when we get up into the 19th century, and with all these critics, now the church saw another need. And that brings us to the First Vatican Council, 1870, called by Pope Pius IX. And just six years before that, Pius IX had issued an encyclical, and he appended to it what we call the Syllabus of Errors. And what, uh, in 1864, what the Pope was worried about was all this enlightened thought, all this rationalism, all this sense, like Nietzsche said, be a friend of the earth, not of heaven. As uh, Feuerbach says, I'm going to change the friends of God into friends of man, believers into thinkers, worshipers into workers, candidates for the other world into students of this world. I'm going to make Christians not half people, but whole persons. See, that, that starts the modern movement. That starts these cultured despisers of religion who fundamentally say we got a better way of being human. We know how to make progress in this world, get rid of this illusory stuff. So what, that, that kicks off modernity, the modern world, and all the enlightenment. Voltaire said, smash the infamous thing. Smash the church because it's in the way of progress. Oh, and those thoughts are creeping around yet in our world. It's an enlightenment kind of thinking. So the Pope is extremely worried about this. He's worried that the church is going to be submerged by the secular culture. He's worried he's going to lose the papal states. And so he, he condemns everything modern. Freedom of the press, democracy, religious liberty, 
all things modern that we associate with the modern experiment, the Pope is against because it's cutting into the revelation. It's threatening the church as a whole. And he calls the council trying to get bishops of the world to sign on to this syllabus of error and to strengthen the papal power. Well, council met, I think it was only about, what was it, October? It met, I think, about nine months. Then war broke out and stopped it. And uh, many theologians would say, thank goodness. One of the more providential wars in history. We didn't get the syllabus of errors uh, canonized by the bishop, by, uh, by the bishop of the world. Now, some things the Pope did accomplish. He accomplished the decree on infallibility. He needed a bulwark against all that skepticism. He needed to show people that you could be sure of the truth. We got absolute certitude when I say it. That's how about how it went. In the doctrine of infallibility, you know, when I, when, when I, as the Pope, make this statement, you can all be sure of it. That's the way around all this doubt and this skepticism that's portrayed by the enlightened and the cultured despisers of religion. So he's going to fight that, and that's got that through. Got through the decree on infallibility, 1870, as a bulwark against uh, modernism. And he also passed another document, a document on that included ideas about revelation. And I think some, uh, some from the perspective of our time today, some, some good things in, in that document. Um, however, when you begin to look at it, at what the Vatican once said about revelation, certain images arise that I think took us in faulty direction. It talks in there about revelation as a deposit of faith. What does that bring? A deposit of faith. Like a collection of truths. Ever since after the time of Aquinas, you got Augustine, very internal, subjective, you know, interior life. You got Aquinas, God's teaching us, but God's doing it. And as time went on to lesser theologians, Revelation ended up getting identified with the propositions, with the dogmas. You got manuals that uh, we would have studied when I was in the seminary that identified Revelation with the dogmas. Just like the fundamentalists today would identify the Revelation with the Bible. It becomes a thing. It becomes a deposit of faith, a collection of truths. When I studied in a seminary and many priests that, uh, of similar age or even younger, um, that's the dominant theology. And once you begin to think of that as the dominant image of Revelation as a collection of truths, and this says it in De Filius, the document that Vatican I produced, now the great thing is to guard it. Church's job is to guard it. Fight off the enemies. That was Pius IX. They're all after us, gang. All these cultured despisers and all these enlightened, they're after us. Circle the wagons. Now, I will speak the truth, and we got this deposit of faith, we're going to guard it. We're not going to let anybody take it over, and infallibility will really save it. And you get the idea then that this revelation is collected. You don't get much sense of John at all. You know, it's, it ended. In fact, they say that, that the revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. It's over. One of the great Enlightenment figures put it, Rousseau, I think it was, Rousseau said, well, if God wanted to speak to me, then why did he speak to Moses? How about a more direct message? And that's the enlightened idea. You know, the, as soon as you say it's all over, say, well, what's in it for me then? I mean, where's the message for me? So this deposit of faith, this collection of truth, is seen as a, in a static way. It's seen as, uh, as a, it's got to be guarded. 
and it's complete, done, finished. Our job is to hand it on. That's Gus's job in that theology to his kids, hand it on, preserve it intact. He can hands on the package, the deposit of truth. In this whole theology, there's great emphasis on acquiring this idea of intellect. That is, what is faith is an intellectual assent to these truths. That's how you know that you're okay. You say yes to it in your head. You don't deny it by heresy. If the Pope says it, you believe it. Bishop teach it, you hold it. Obedience to that the intellect assents to that truth. So there we have a whole notion of what Revelation is all about. 1870 carries the day all the way into our own time. Until we get who Richard McBrien in his book Lives of the Papacy says that at that point we get to the greatest of all the popes who ever lived. That's McBrien. Well, he's here next week. I should let him talk for himself. You get to his great hero. That's John the 23rd. Now we got to uh, call a council again. Now we got a totally different personality behind it. Not a defensive, worried person, but a person says, I'm Joseph, your brother. Open. Let's talk about it. Let's open the windows. Let in some fresh air. Let's have a new Pentecost. We'll have a council even if the advisors are worried about this. So now, the whole thing...